Bitte schön. How about a Whopper? Don't make that a double Whopper. With American cheese, large American French fries, and a great big American chocolate shake. No sauerkraut, no schnitzel. Welcome to Hello, This is the Doomed Show. I am Richard. Folks, it has been approximately three years since my co-host has been on the show, so I'm very excited to have my pal Scott from EuroCultAV.com back on the show. Hello, Scott. Hey, everybody. So, Scott, you picked a movie. You got you got inspired, and I, I got a little scared. I, I got to say, this is it, it, this is just not a typical pick for me. So, yeah. <laughs> This is this is a rarity for uh, Hello, This is the Doom Show. We we don't do comedies. Like we've done um one comedy that had no horror in it many years ago, a little movie called The Face with Two Left Feet. That was a, a Jeffrey pick from way long ago. That's the uh John Travolta tra- ugh, it's hard to say. John Travolta exploitation movie. Where they they uh the Italians made a movie cuz they had a guy who looked like John Travolta. <laughs> I uh, highly recommend you watch that. <laughs> That's kind of a hard element in itself that you have a cult, a clone of John Travolta. <laughs> oh, man, don't waste it. Don't waste it. <laughs> right. But no, this is a uh, gotcha. G-O-T-C-H-A exclamation point, or as I call it, gotch me. Gotch me when you watch me from 1985. <laughs> oh, boy. This is a very special film. This is directed by uh, Jeff Canoe. I don't know why his name makes me laugh. <laughs> Did you see the DP's name? Yes, King Baggett. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! But yeah, Jeff Canoe. There's no news without good canoes or something. This son of a bitch directed Revenge of the Nerds, one of the most embarrassing films I ever watched with my parents. Still to this <laughs> day, so humiliated by that experience. <laughs> Oh boy. I have to admit, uh, even all these years later, I'm kind of a nerd's apologist. So He directed two very strange things before, you know, years before uh, Gotcha. Let me see. Let me scroll down here. Um, he did something called Natural Enemies, which uh, this plot blew my mind. Hal Holbrook stars in a movie where a man hires five hookers to fulfill a Final Fantasy before killing himself and his family. That's, uh, I kind of feel like I need to see that. <laughs> it sounds incredibly weird. And like one of those like uh, depressing movies. There's a Jack Lemmon movie that has sort of a similar plot, but it's just Jack Lemmon having sex with a younger hippie girl. And he goes, I love life. I'm thinking maybe Las Vegas, uh, but, oh, you know. Oh, yeah, but with murder. <laughs> right. Uh, he also directed, uh, uh, <laughs> Troop Beverly Hills, so, you know. Uh, he directed V.I. Warshawski, which uh, my dad, during that movie, my dad had to explain to me what a body, what a body double was. Because <laughs> Kathleen Turner got naked, and I was, like, looking at it, he could tell I was, like, transfixed. And he's like, you know that's not her, right? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, she doesn't look like that. That They don't show 
if they don't show the actress's face, it's because they're using a body double. And I was like, whoa. So that's that's my dad imparting his knowledge on me. <laughs> and then Brian De Palma eventually would make body double and hammer that home. Oh, my God. He he drilled at home. <laughs> hey, hey, let's see. Um, I have a beautiful uh, gotcha TV spot I'm going to drop in here right now because I suspect the trailer's three minutes of the whole movie. So here's the <laughs> TV spot for gotcha. I would kill or die to make love to you. I know. Gotcha! Is it a romance? Gotcha! Are you a spy or something? Is it a comedy? I think I'm in love with her. Is it a mystery? You're a regular James Bond, man. Is it a game? Gotcha! gotcha. Or is it real? They're chasing me. They're trying to kill me. It's gotcha! rated PG-13. Starts Friday at select theaters. I'm going to use my Googling powers and see if I can find a VHS tape of Gotcha. I probably should stop saying it like that. I kind of want a VHS tape for this now that, you know, the Blu-ray's out. That's kind of <laughs> where I'm at. Oh, you know what's great? Duck, duck, go. What a great search engine. And it keeps your uh, VHS searches private. It, I don't like it at all. I go back to Google all the time. I can never find the the big images, if you know what I mean. The, the only thing Duck, duck, go has going for it is the fact that it doesn't catalog what you're searching for. But I, I, miss, I miss being watched. <laughs> Google search algorithm is popular for a reason. All right. Let's see. Is this in English? Oh, that's German. Okay. I can't read that. You find a German VHS tape? Yep. That's amazing. <laughs> that's fitting. I wonder. Yeah, exactly. It's the plotting. Oh, yeah. We're going to spoil this whole movie. So, folks, go get gotcha before you get gotcha by this uh, discussion. There we go. Nope. That's in German, too. <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> All right, fuck it. I'm reading off the old IMDb butthole. Here we go. Jonathan plays gotcha with fellow college students testing ability as assassin or mark using paintball guns on campus. He flies to Paris on vacation and with a woman taking his virginity on to Berlin where the game slash ammo gets real. That's fucking terrible. <laughs> that's a great, that's, yeah, that's quite the synopsis. Oh, boy. Someone named uh, Bill Conti did the music. He's he's pretty well known. Yeah, yeah, Rocky. I mean, he, looking back on his career, he's like my biggest success. It was Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Rocky. I wrote that in the weekend. I bet if we interviewed him, he's like Gotcha. You want to talk about that? <laughs> Where are you going, man? Don't you want to finish the interview? I got places <laughs> to be. So yeah, Karate Kid three. Ooh. Baby Boom. Oh, of course. Here we go. Masters of the Universe. Oh, man. That was great. I have been dying to revisit that. I think that's on Prime, and I'm looking at it like, hmm. Hmm. I haven't seen that since the theater, man. What was that, 1989? Yeah, I think so. I just remember my parents, when they uh, got their hearts broken by me, when I decided I hated He-Man. I was like, they bought me all the He-Man toys, and then all of a sudden I'm like, hey man, stupid. I <laughs> want freaking Transformers, which are infinitely more expensive. And then <laughs> I saved them by saying, I hate Transformers. I want G.I. Joe. And they said, oh, thank God, these things are only like $1.99. Thank you. <laughs> I was so spoiled. A big shocker, everybody. I was a very spoiled child. Well, That's in the eighties, there was like all these different toy lines, man. That made you just want them all. It was it was uh, the eighties. You had to have them, right? Get this opening credits here. I call the middle finger title. Yeah. So, well, okay. I'm jumping to the credit <laughs> the credit sequence. So I got to get into uh, high school shooter the movie or just college shooter the movie. This opening scene would. I mean, if, if someone wanted to actually remake this film today, this opening scene would seriously not fly. Nope. He, this guy, uh, our our hero, I should mention, Anthony Edwards, uh, from good old ER, or as I call it, uh, 
He is following a fellow student around campus. He's wearing uh, not quite fatigues, but he's definitely wearing like army color clothes. And he pulls out a fucking gun out from under his jacket. And I work on a college campus. We get (laughs) regular training for what to do if someone pulls a gun out on campus. So as soon as I'm watching this with 2021 eyes, my brain (laughs) broke in half. I was like, holy shit, this would never fly today. I literally made that same note. And, you know, (laughs) I'm a software developer at a, you know, major corporation. I'm like, oh, my God, this would not fly in 2021. He does some parkour. I'm sure that's still hip with all you cool kids. The parkour. He's jumping around, doing somersaults, trying to catch this kid, this poor defenseless child. Shoots him with a paintball gun. Bumps into a girl. Pisses her off because she pours her Diet Pepsi on her on her breasts. Then he asks her on a date. And as she's saying no, she turns around and flips him off. And we get a lady with her middle finger out and the gotcha titles. I was like, this is appropriate. <laughs> oh, boy. And now we get the theme song. Holy shit, dude. This right? theme song. This has been in my head for over 30 years, this theme song. So you, you've seen this before. I saw this as a kid. This was another yeah. one of those movies I watched with my parents. Luckily, there's less sex in it for them to hide my eyes or laugh and go, oh, you don't understand what's happening. And I'm crying, like, literal tears of blood shooting out of my eyes. Well, blame blame it on I Rio. Remember being, right. Ugh. I remember this being on TV all the time. Yeah. I, I never... You know, the first time I've seen it on Cut was last week on the Blu-ray. Yep. Before that, it was like, gotcha on WTOG 44. <laughs> uh, the strudel. That, actually, the strudel scene was, like, the thing I was waiting for to happen. I was like, the strudel! The strudel! Well, well, I'm jumping ahead. I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, yeah. Was, so yeah. we get to meet our pal here. We get to know him a little better, Jonathan. Uh, but his pal is Manolo, played by, and I struggled with this name when we talked about him. Nick Corey. Uh, yeah, Nick Corey, also known as JSU Garcia. I'm going to say Sue, just Sue Garcia. Sue Garcia. Thank you. It was amazing seeing him i love him because i love him in nightmare on elm street of course and he's not a fucking fruitcake no 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 no. he is all man baby his shtick is so fun in this movie also something that would get you in a lot of trouble but we'll talk about that when we talk about that he's trying to help jonathan get laid which is why it was not even remotely surprising at all that this was from the same guy who did revenge of the nerds right so they go to class and they're they're in uh, veterinary school together, which I thought was a weird what? The and tiger? Yes, the, the teacher has a tiger in a cage, a real tiger, and he shoots it with a tranquilizer gun after making a quaint date rape joke. I had to rewind this to make sure I heard this right. He's like, hey, <laughs> this will knock out a you know, big cat like this. <laughs> it's probably popular at you guys' parties and everyone in the and the classroom goes, <laughs> and I went, I need to hear that again. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> he tranks this poor tiger and the tiger like tries to get away and just smashes its head into the bars. And Leah and I are like, what is happening? This poor tiger. Hello, 1985. I was like, well, at least he didn't get any momentum behind him because the cage was so small. But still, good Lord. They're going to Europe together. To, to Paris to try to get laid and he has to ask his parents now oh my god Jonathan's parents Alex Rocco the the inimitable Alex Rocco you've seen him in a movie because he was in 171 movies oh yeah he passed away in 2015 and movies with him continued to come out after he died because he was so prolific just look him up. He's he's incredible. He's great. Uh, but him him and his mom, his mom's played by Marla Adams, who I don't know. She was in Gotcha. She's a soap opera actress. She's in all kinds of soaps and TV shows. But yeah, she was primarily TV lady. But they they're have this cute thing back and forth, arguing about letting him go to Europe. And they let him go to Europe, which is 
I call it perverts on parade because Jonathan and Manolo are trying so hard to get laid that it's disgusting. Like lying about. Oh my God. Here's the thing about this movie. It's hit or miss with the comedy. Like there is a two jokes that I literally was like, that was funny. That's one joke. And then later another joke happened. I go, that's two, two jokes that made me laugh. It does comedy. Find me. Yeah, it does the thriller stuff and even like the drama romance stuff even better. The comedy is just like, meh. <laughs> I was surprised how the espionage and suspense stuff actually played out reasonably well. Exactly. That's exactly um, how I feel. What I liked about this was like there's these, like that like it just kind of like was this genre blend of like really bad sex comedy and espionage. And I'm like, who thought of this? <laughs> Manolo is trying he's pretending he's a terrorist he goes up to <laughs> random women he he's trying to get um Swedish or Swiss I forget which I think it was Swedish he'd go up to the most uh Swedish looking woman and be like I'm a terrorist please I am innocent of all the charges I'm just trying to defend my homeland come back to my hotel room it's the weirdest thing ever craziest pickup line he doesn't get laid with the one girl. He's like, oh, she was Swiss. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, so Jonathan is, uh, he's alone while Manolo's trying to get laid. And he's uh, being rude because, of course, the uh, the stereotype of France is that French people are rude to Americans. And Jonathan's like, I'll show them. I'll go and ruin their country. I found it kind of weird because it's like, you know, he's being the rude American and the waiter's just like... This is the absinthe you want. <laughs> He's drinking Pernod, like getting fucking wasted. And there's this cute lady flirting with him. And this cute lady is Cinemax's own Linda Fiorentino because she was in Jade, which, if I recall correctly, was on Cinemax or Skinemax all the time. No, no, no. She was in Last Seduction. Oh, and yes. Jade. <laughs> she had a type she liked to play. She was also in Kicked in the Head playing basically the same character. I love it. So she's flirting with him. And obviously Li Linda Fiorentino on her worst day is still not in Anthony Edwards League. No, wait, the other way around. <laughs> yeah, Anthony Edwards Anthony is Edwards hot, Edwards. but yeah. <laughs> Linda Fiorentino is slightly hotter. <laughs> she out perverts him. She gets more perverted than he is. She's like, I like Wargens because... I can touch their young bodies, and it's like, whoa. See, that's where Miracle Mile got the Anthony Edwards thing right, because I think, you know, <laughs> the, the woman in Miracle Mile looked like Anthony Edwards League. <laughs> yes, yes, they were very sweet. Um, that had a happy ending, right? Oh, but it had the happiest ending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, they, they have a little meet cute, and then they start having sex. And I was like, okay, he's still on the plane dreaming. He's he or he's had a head injury because none of this can be happening. How are they having sex? This is not real. <laughs> but sure enough, it, this is actually the movie. It's not a dream sequence. Now, the uncut version has nudity in it. Or was this like before they knew what PG-13 was, they they said, I guess you could show boobs once. Right. I think that's because the uncut when I say uncut, I mean PG-13 because Yeah. Like when it was on TV, there was not a boob shot, but there was like in the in the scene where there's like a. I mean, this is later on in the movie where he yeah. where they're behind the Iron Curtain, and she's being like stripped down. I guess um, there's a there's a boob shot. In case you haven't noticed, the gotcha elements are completely abandoned for this entire most of the movie. Like right. the whole premise is this assassination game, and it is gone. Yeah, like I, a really I, long time. The funny thing is, the first five minutes like got me in trouble in middle school. Oh, let's hear and this. Do you know what a rubber band gun is? Yeah. Okay, so um, I saw this movie, and I was like, "Oh my god, playing like paintball tag at school would be great," but I I'm not 18, so I can't buy a paintball gun. So we found these rubber band guns at Walmart, and we started carrying them around school in our backpacks to play gotcha <laughs> in the halls of our middle school, oh my which god. lasted about. Which lasted about half a day because they're big plastic things with triggers. And we all get called down to like the dean's office and get referrals in Saturday school. And yeah, 
got them taken away and confiscated all because of this movie. Oh my god. I mean, oh my gotcha. Yeah, so, exactly. So, so thanks, the, gotcha. I had to go to Saturday school because of you. The administration of your school got you Hard. I like that. That's brilliant. They go to Berlin because uh, he's going to break up with Manolo. Their, their gay marriage is now canceled. They're going to go off to uh, Sasha and Jonathan are going to go off to Berlin. And immediately she's like, by the way, we're going to East Berlin. What could go wrong? <laughs> going to <laughs> Berlin with this strange woman and then getting uh, freaking communized by the communists. And then the maid joke happens where Jonathan tries to call home. And their maid, uh, who's Hispanic, answers the phone. And there's some comedy because she doesn't understand him. (laughs) I want to blow my brains out. (laughs) Now, uh, granted, this maid character, uh, Rosario, this is uh, Irene Olga Lopez who plays the maid. And she's great. She's wonderful. But there will be a stereotype to beat the hell out of this stereotype, like a stereotype par excellence coming up i mean obviously you know there's the czechoslovakian stereotypes and the the, the russian stereotypes and the german stereotypes and the french How many stereotypes. Can we fit in one movie yes those are fine you know white people can make fun of other white people it all works out but yeah we'll get back to uh, the hispanic section in a little while and then my strip search fantasies get realized, because while they're in East Berlin, Sasha is a courier. I don't know why I said it like that. I was trying to do another accent. That failed. Uh, she's a courier, and she's supposed to be picking up something, and she gets paid for picking up whatever this something is. Spoiler alert, we never find out what this is. It's what... Well, the strudel. Uh, it's, the, it's not the strudel. I thought it was the strudel. It's what uh, Alfred Hitchcock uh, famously referred to as a McMuffin. No, a I'm just <laughs> a MacGuffin, McMuffin. <laughs> <laughs> the microfilms in the strudel. It was a roll of film, but they never reveal what in the world any of this was. It was something spy stuff. They literally say the phrase spy stuff like five times. Okay, I gotta say, I love that. You remember uh, Martin, the George Romero film? Yes. Where he's like, so he he describes uh, sex as sexy stuff. Spy stuff, sexy stuff. I don't know. I find this is kind of oddly hysterical. It's stuff we don't want to research to write about in the screenplay. Fine. Move on. Stuff uh, so, is shorthand. Uh, Alex, uh, Alex, uh, Jonathan, I just changed his name. He gets into trouble for uh, carrying pornography, which is a copy of Playboy. And he gets stripped, searched down to his tidy whities And I said, eyes up here, Mr. Mr. German checkpoint man. And then he gets away. So Sasha has to bail because she gets captured. She gives Jonathan a code, a code phrase. So he knows to just get out of the country, he gets out of the country. And then as he's leaving and gets past the checkpoint, he gets into West Berlin and he has the funniest joke in the movie where he asks this amazing American serviceman, like, am I in West Berlin? The guy's like, yeah. And he turns around, he gives a middle finger to East <laughs> Berlin and goes, fuck you. And then as he's walking away, the guy's like, man, I've been wanting to do that for six months. I did crack up at that scene. I did. Oh, oh is that- man, that was great. I, I'm still don't, <laughs> I still don't remember what the other funny joke was. It wasn't as good as that one. That was great. There was a bit of levity there because, you know, the, the whole East Berlin stuff, it, it's, it's kind of, you know suspenseful and bleak yeah. a little bit this is one of those things that uh, luckily doesn't exist anymore but it'd be like a tourist going to north korea now so it'd be bad yeah probably worse than north korea <laughs> yeah they're having fun up there he's immediately chased by these russian goons because he does not know that he has this uh, secret role of film and they're chasing him and i swear one of these Russian goons looks just like D. Boone from Minutemen. It's kind of waiting for him to just start hopping around on stage or something. <laughs> I felt like a gringo. Help! <laughs> there's, there's my, there's my Minutemen reference for the day. You're welcome. So he, he does get out of, he gets home. He manages to do some parkour 
some extreme gotcha ness without a gun, without his uh, trusty paintball gun. He gets away from these guys, gets home to America, and sure enough, <laughs> the Russians follow him to America. Five Russian agents follow him to America. Or four, I forget. I can't believe all of these guys made it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So he's trying to call the, the FBI, trying to call the CIA, and we get this this long stretch of the movie that's all paranoia, and the CIA is only in it for themselves. They're not. They don't really give a shit about him. So he's playing and both the sides. Think he's not- exactly. They're like so excited that they're going to get this film back because they're like, oh, he's coming to us. He called. He's going to come to us. And then we find out None that this part really made sense. It's like no, that exactly. Leah and I were like, this part is bullshit. We find out Sasha's CIA. Sasha is not a Czechoslovakian courier bouncing between. Uh, Berlin and East Berlin. She is actually an American. And that's when my brain was like, why the hell didn't they just have her call him? Right. She took his virginity. He will follow her to hell and back. <laughs> like, it is so... Like, they're trying to do all these schemes to get it back. And it's like, have her call him. Yeah, pretty much. Oh my god, it's so silly. So, now he's still it's on like- the run. Because even though he's he's made contact with Sasha and made contact with them, she's still in danger because these Russian guys will kill her and kill him. And that's when we get the homeboys. <sighs> okay. Manolo is, is Hispanic. He's, he's yeah. uh, presumably Mexican-American. And he has a bunch of uh, his, his buddies show up to intimidate the CIA. They've all got machine guns or shotguns, and they've all got the cars with the fancy rims that bounce up and down, and uh, it's so bad, dude. Oh, yeah. He's like, he's like, Manolo, are you still a homeboy? <laughs> I, I kind of wanted, like, the cast of Repo Man to appear around this point. Yes. <laughs> no, this car's hot. Really hot. <laughs> You mean stolen? No, I do. I can quote everything from Repo Man. Oh my god! Well, it's oh. one of the great right there. The L.A. of the '80s, like right at that moment, I'm just like, oh my god, yes, let's get Emilio Estevez in here and everything. <laughs> this car's worth let's twenty-five. Let's turn this car green and fly out of here. Exactly. This car's worth twenty-five thousand dollars. <laughs> Uh, so then we have the ridiculous climax where good old Jonathan and Sasha are on the campus, the college campus, and the Russians are coming after them. And Jonathan actually says, they're on my turf now. So he remembers Great. the, <laughs> he remembers the freaking uh, tranquilizer gun and gets the tranquilizer gun and proceeds to gotcha these guys and knock them out, which I thought was really funny because. Oh, yeah. They never want him to be a murderer, <laughs> but he's using tranquilizers that can down a freaking tiger, which outweighs a human by how much? A lot. <laughs> These guys are dead. Uh, but of course, every time he shoots them, he goes, gotcha. <laughs> I came up with a drinking game while watching this. Oh, by no. The way. So if I ever get around to watching this again, and I actually enjoyed the experience, regardless of, you know, like, my, um, take a sip when he introduces himself as Jonathan Moore, because you hear his name. I'm Jonathan Moore. (laughs) Jonathan Moore, right? Moore. And then finish your drink. (laughs) Right. Finish the drink when anyone says gotcha. (laughs) Very simple. Jonathan Mm. Moore, take a sip. Finish your drink. Gotcha. Oh, my God. You'll be very drunk by the end. Yes. Uh, Hispanic stereotype, three shots. <laughs> <laughs> that, too. Oh I had God. that in there. I'm taking that note. So he he and Sasha kind of patch things up because he was very angry with her that she lied to him. But it's she's like, I taught you how to have sex, so now you're mine or whatever. And then he's back on campus. Or no, he's he's walking away from this whole scene. He's still armed with a tranquilizer gun. And that girl with the Pepsi, excuse me, sorry, Diet Pepsi from the beginning of the movie, she bumps into him again and 
calls him a jerk or something because he's a jerk. Yeah, well, is there a single like ethical character in this movie? No, no, his parents. But you know they've Cost- done they're rich they've done terrible things. <laughs> right. So he, without a moment's hesitation, he takes out that tranquilizer gun, and the final freeze frame of the movie is this motherfucker shooting an innocent girl in the butt with a tranquilizer gun. (laughs) The best thing that can happen is that she falls on her face and like knocks a tooth out. You know, she probably died. My, my literal note here was expelled or arrested (laughs) or hopefully both. That's how you're ending this. He he like (laughs) saves America from the Russians and then he gets himself like expelled and arrested. That's right. He he, you know, he saved us with film, a, a roll of film. There's that screenwriting rule. I remember if you show a gun in like the first act, you have to use it in the third. And so they showed a tranquilizer gun in the first act, and they used it in the third. They show this uh, college girl in the first act, and they shoot her with a tranquilizer gun from the first act. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Am I in West Berlin now? Sure. Fuck you! Good night. I've been wanting to do that for the last six months. Speaking of writing, uh, this was written by Dan Gordon, who a uh, pretty prolific writer. He uh, worked on such things as Passenger 57, uh, Wyatt Earp. He wrote uh, Sidekicks. Oh, oh, wait, no, he wrote the... T- he wrote the TV series Sidekicks, so. Oh. <laughs> Masterful writing on this one. <laughs> I went through about 10, 15 years where I couldn't really watch a ton of slasher films outside of, like, nostalgia purposes. Right. So I've been going back and watching, you know, like, the classic slashers and stuff I hadn't seen. And then parlaying from that, watching, like, just uh, old 80s movies, and it's like, man... You know, you think that by the 80s, they were starting to kind of come around on things? No. 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 Like, Revenge of the Nerds has, like, very racist and rapey. Yeah. And there's always something homophobic. There's always, right. like, uh, what is it? Uh, the one Liette and I watch all the time. Uh, Once Bitten. Oh, God, yeah. So I love that one. much homophobic stuff in that movie. Oh, my God. It's terrible. But it's still, these are enjoyable movies. We were watching Hiding Out. Do you ever see Hiding Out? I have not seen that. Uh, That's the one, just to refresh the people's memories. I can never remember this poor actor's name. Well, he's probably a millionaire, so he's not poor. Right. Uh, John Cryer. John Cryer, he's a a, a freaking Wall Street guy who works for some gangsters and then has to go back to high school to hide out because reasons. I think I have seen that one. Rewatch it, my friend. It has got oh. some very... It's got a plot thread in it that's very um, uh, immoral. <laughs> As an aside, Pretty in Pink just got a Blu-ray release finally, but it's in a five-pack of other Blu-rays. Ah. So I'm picking that up. I rewatched Bill and Ted a few years ago, the first one. Nice. And, you know, they insult each other in, like, the castle sequence by calling each other, you know, the, F, the other F word. Ah. Uh. And I'm just like, you know, this is an almost perfect movie, and then you do that. Hey, yeah, people just really threw that around like it was a plot point. <laughs> it's so bad. Like, <gasps> okay. uh, watching this, I'm just like, I understand why I had like this weird sense of nostalgia for it. Like, I was so, I, I remember begging, like, I would, I would contact people at Shout Factory that I, I knew because of you were a cult baby, and I'm like, you guys are into weird pop culture stuff. This is your type of film i was i've been asking for them to put this out and cloak and dagger do you remember cloak and dagger oh yeah of course i loved cloak and dagger as a kid i yeah that oh boy that and daryl exactly yeah those were good enough uh, what was that other one uh flight of the navigator that's another one yeah there's a blu-ray of it but it's in the uk and i'm getting tired of importing mainstream films in (laughs) You know, like, I don't mind paying for something, like, really obscure, like Blue Rita, that I know is not going to come out here in the States. Yeah. But, like, Flight of the Navigator is a Disney film, man. It's, it, it's Blu-ray starting, like, 2006. I should not be, you know. So, uh, I go to Chef Factory and I keep saying, get gotcha out here, man. It's just, <laughs> it starts 
friggin' Anthony Edwards from ER. I mean, come on. And then finally, Kino Lorber gets it out. And, you know, like, I let it sit on my shelf for six months. So, um, <laughs> obviously, my enthusiasm didn't, uh, you know, get me to watch it. Well, it, it's hard because, you know, everyone's been home for the last year. And I knew that it had sex. Like, I knew the Linda Florentino, Fiorentino yeah. that you know, I'm just like, uh, you know, guy loses his virginity and then follows woman around Europe. It's glorious. So. Uh, a little bit of trivia. Um, apparently, <clears throat> excuse me. Apparently, the real live uh, action game Gotcha is also known by names such as Assassin, Killer, Elimination, Paranoia, Juggernaut, Assassins, Battle Royale, Circle of Death, and Chaos, which stands for Killing is Organized Sport. So if you want to play paintball, you can go up to your friends and be like, hey, you want to play Circle of Death? Yeah, no. <laughs> they won't know what you're talking about. Uh, so apparently Gotcha is a real game, as we as we talked about. Uh, but a lot of universities have actual Gotcha clubs, and uh, they coordinate the games for its partici- participants, hopefully avoiding false school shooter uh, reportings. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, this blew my mind. I did not know this until I started watching a video on the Nintendo Entertainment System. There's a I video game called Gotcha the Sport. You have it? Mm-hmm. Nice. It has nothing to do with the movie. Nope. It's just like a literal. It's it's a light. It works with a light gun. It works with a controller. It, it, you like have like this like foresty backdrop, and you're shooting people with paintball. It's not a very deep game. Nope. I think I haven't I haven't pulled it out in like 15, 20 years. <laughs> I probably should have pulled it out for just to remind myself what it looked like. My games are buried on uh, like stacks of games on top of stacks of games. So I'm just nice. like. Well, I'll one drop of a little of the music in here so we can get nostalgic for a game I never played. It's one of those games. Like, I, honestly, I felt like, um, do you remember the Go Go Their Team games? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, they're I feel good. like those are actually more appropriate to this movie than, uh, <laughs> than Go- the Gotcha. Because, like, Go Go Their Team, top secret episode, you know, you're like a spy that's going behind the Iron Curtain, and it's got all these kind of spy tropes to it. See, I'm surprised because that was where my parents drew the line. After after the uh, they bought all those He-Man toys for me, and they bought all the Transformers, and they bought all the uh, GI Joe men for me, they were like, yeah. "What are video games? No, <laughs> you're on your own, buddy." So my parents would buy the video games they wanted to play for themselves, and I had to save up my allowance and buy used games. So I had some of the worst Nintendo games of all time. So I'm okay, shocked. I'm shocked I didn't have Gotcha. Okay, but, but what did you have? Because well, I mean, I've got see, stacks behind. Some of the games, I mean, were amazing. Like Castlevania Two has this reputation for being bad, but that's my favorite of the Castlevania games. I dispute that. Castlevania Two for like a decade was one of my favorite games of yeah. all time. Yeah, um, I had a game. I cannot remember the name of it. It was Boats. You were. It was like this. Cobra overhead Triangle. Sh- What's it called? Cobra Triangle. Cobra Triangle. That game is cool at first. And then you realize nothing else Hard is going to happen. It's really repetitive and boring as balls. I think that's a. I got. I can. I know what you're talking about because it's made by the rare who did RC Pro Am. And the first few levels are really good, and then it ramps up hardness. But it's yeah. also basically the same thing as the beginning. Yeah. I, exactly. I, exactly. So yeah, I, I was I was uh, playing whatever nobody else wanted. Those were my games. It, Those are the ones I can remember the best. In the early 90s, I remember you go to KB Toy Store, and they would have, like, Nintendo games for, like, $5, brand wow. new in the box, right? And you'd find crap like Time Lord or Street Fighter 2010, the final fight, which had a <laughs> character named Ken, but he's, like, 20 years in the future, where everything was suddenly science fiction. I don't know how they got 2010 <laughs> as science fiction, but there you go. And they were badass games. There's, like, five yeah. bucks for this? great i wish i'd kept them because they're like there were like games like mighty final fight they're like 200 bucks now you know so i was always i was always in that i never understood why they couldn't get the arcade version 
to translate to the NES. Yes. Yeah. I never knew how much more processing power the frickin' standalone game had. They had to keep dumbing it down to fit on a cartridge, so things like um, Smash TV, which were brilliant in the arcade, were just oh, hideous on uh, Nintendo. Oh, the NES Smash TV. I own that. I, 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 you know, I own like probably 100 <laughs> Nintendo cartridges right now. Right. Smash TV is not one of them because I'd prefer to smash it than actually play it. Yeah, it's you know it's, the arcade game with the the oh, dual controllers. Beautiful. That thing. Oh my God! Such a great action. Now, Heavy Barrel, the Heavy Barrel NES game. That thing plays extremely well. Yeah, I was a little disappointed by the graphics, but yeah, that one I remember playing and being like, "Dude, this is as fun as the arcade." It looks like shit, but it's as fun as the arcade one. Oh yeah. And, oh, that Heavy Barrel. And you kill everyone on the screen, and you're like, no. at, "This is real gotcha." At the beginning of this, I was buying up uh, like old Genesis games and old uh, NES games. I remember because they're dumb as shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for the most part. Oh and yeah. I just, I could just play like Golden Axe two for like oh. twenty minutes, beat crap up, die, and not feel like I wasted my time. Exactly. Well, we went on a tangent. Yeah. And I'm it glad happened. we did. Overall, how do you like Gotcha? I was not dis. Okay, so it, when I finished it, I'm like, this is not. I, I feel like I was so excited for this movie being on Blu-ray, finding it in this great HD release, and it felt like I felt like it was largely mediocre. I'll be honest. Yeah. You know, I did. I wasn't like. I'm glad I got this. Let me backtrack a bit. Like, I used to see the Road Warrior on TV all the time as a kid. Right. Oh yeah. And then I, I never owned it on VHS. I never owned it on DVD. I got the, my one of the first five Blu-rays I bought because I got it for six bucks in like 2008 on Blu-ray when I first got my first Blu-ray player. And it has that great opening moment where you see the, 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 the car and it's like, in a, it's like boxed in and they open up to this magnificent widescreen. But you wouldn't see that on like full screen TV in the 1980s and 90s, right? So right away, you're getting this greater experience. But then there's like a rape scene in there and all this other stuff. And I just thought this was like this, you know, monumental, you know, great action film. But there's all this darker stuff in the film. Now, I'm going to say that the Road Warrior was actually a better experience on Blu-ray, even of course, with the... yes. This, I was like, this is one of those films where nostalgia, I think, steered me wrong. You know, like, I'm happy to have seen it, but I'm just like... Man, you know, uh, I'm glad we're not in the 80s anymore. <laughs> I think you said it best that like uh, it's not a good movie, but the experience was fun. This was a fun watch. I'm glad you picked it. And it's just crazy how the things I remember, like that freaking theme song and the freaking strudel. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like I, It's so weird when your brain is anticipating something you haven't seen in 30 years. And the joy you get, like, it's like, it's a man, I believe it's the guy who looks vaguely like D. Boone, destroying a strudel with his bare hands, and your brain's like, this is what I was waiting for. And you're like, <laughs> why the fuck was I waiting for this? Oh, uh, it's so <laughs> weird. <laughs> but no, it's it's something. I mean, oh God, like, the the minefield of 80s movies, like we were talking about, the the how politically incorrect things were, which... It's fine that that stuff happened on film. Who cares? It's just when the movie wallows in it as a joke, that's when you're like, I don't feel good. <laughs> that's the thing. I, I don't, you know, like, I'm way past the point where some of this stuff is, you know, even like five years after the last time I saw this, I would have been like, uh, what? <laughs> yes. You know? Oh, like, I was much worse. I, it would have took me 20 years before I noticed anything bad about things. Like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> I'm a terrible person. Like I said, you know, like, I still will defend, like, I'll pull out a DVD. I have a DVD set somewhere, Revenge of the Nerds. And Revenge of the Nerds is extremely trashy. But, you know, I saw it at the right time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, I can go back to it. But I know for a fact that everything in it is extremely not good. You should have watched it with my parents, with your my mom covering your eyes during all the naughty oh bits. God. And all you really want to do is leave the room because, I mean, 
hey, nudity is cool when you're a kid, but I don't want to watch that with my parents. I was obsessed with uh, the Godfather films as a kid. I'm not even kidding. From the age of like five or six, nice. I, I, I memorized the lines of those. But I remember when I was when I was a teenager and I started to realize what you know all that stuff was. I'd put it on the table with my mom and the the sex scene with Michael and Apollonia. I'd be like, "This is where I go to pee." Gotta go. <laughs> right, like you know, nudity in front of your mother. Never a thing you want. <laughs> mom, you're on your own. I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Yeah, and and because I watched it with some fair amount of frequency, and because I had no social life until like the tail end of high school, like I would, uh, oh, it's Saturday night, I'm watching a movie with my mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, my my parents were surprisingly li- surprisingly liberal with movies. They they were gonna watch whatever the hell they wanted. I was just along for the ride. Like so, they never worried about R-rated sexy movies, which is why I've seen. So many, like the Porky's movies, the the Revenge of the Nerds, Blame It on Rio, um, take any 80s movie with an awkward sexual scene. I have seen that on the couch with my parents when I was like eight or ten. It was humiliating. It happened over okay. and over again. That's the story I hear from a lot of people. My Ooh. my mom wouldn't watch that stuff in front of me when I was a kid intentionally, but I, I have this memory of my dad taking me to his mother's apartment. He was staying with her, I think, but he wouldn't tell me that. And he had a mattress that was like pushed up against her couch, and they decided to watch Death Wish. <laughs> and I'm there, and he just said for me to sit on the couch behind the mattress that was propped up. And I'm like, well... We do the stay here for two hours and watch the entire movie, but there was a mirror, a frame with a <laughs> mirrored reflection. And so, you know, even though I wasn't allowed to watch the movie because it was too extreme, I could see the entire thing, including the opening rape scene, and the reflection of the mirror. And I'm just that's like, that's insane. <laughs> that's good parenting. Like the sounds um, of the movie wouldn't traumatize you enough. <laughs> exactly. Death Wish. I mean, mm. I've seen it multiple times since then. It's just, no. It's like my uh, my know? grandpa. He he was he didn't care that we were all staying at their house. He was gonna watch Hard Bodies. <laughs> he didn't give a shit. He's gonna watch Hard Bodies. So I'm there laying on the recliner, pretending to be asleep, while he sits on the other recliner behind me, watching Hard Bodies. And every few minutes. He would thought I was awake, so he'd get up and he'd stare at me. <laughs> so I have my creepy grandpa oh, glaring at me in the darkness, and then he'd go back and sit down. I'd just open my eyes back up and watch freaking hard bodies. It's so fucking gross. I mean, I, that's, how does it, it just relates to all this? I mean, you know, you go back like 30 years, and they just made shit that was just like... Ooh. I think there was a certain point, though. I think this is like the beginning of the video age, where you're like, mm-hmm. what can I get away with? You know, now that this stuff is going to, people are going to watch this at home on video. You know, it's all it's good. Like, it's all good. Right. Like, you know, we could kind of cross boundaries because, you know, the, the, the exploitation movies aren't going to be going directly into trashy movie theaters or going directly into houses. Mm. Temple of Doom has scenes where people are, you know, eating eyeballs and ripping out hearts, but that's okay for kids. Yeah. Uh, Brad so. got me at Hard Bodies on Blu-ray for Christmas. And oh my god! I opened the pa- like the the wrapping off my present. And it was my heart sunk. It made <laughs> me feel so uncomfortable opening up that. I've still not, I've I not know. like gotten the strength. Uh, I probably need to get drunk and then watch uh, Hard Bodies. But I'll make I'll make Lietta pretend she's asleep. And I'll <laughs> act like I'm getting away with something. So I can, I'm like a serial killer replicating that moment. <laughs> I uh I can't I, I don't remember what that movie is. I'm gonna be honest. It's it's just I a sex comedy, but it's like it is wall to wall sex comedy. Like there is very little in the movie that isn't three middle aged men trying to get laid. There's it's all sex jokes. The whole so movie. like porkies. Yes, yes. Well, dude, I think we've we've covered video games. We've yeah. covered uh, direct direct to video dirty movies, and now yeah. We're coming back to gotcha. <laughs> right. So we gotcha. We gotcha, yeah, folks. I mean, I'll be honest. There's not a lot of material in gotcha to cover. It's like they go behind the iron curtain. You basically have an espionage thriller that surrounded by a sex comedy, surrounded by a paintball thing that just, <clears throat> that doesn't need to be there, to be no. honest. Nope. 
It's like, let's get the paintball kids in here. And now that you're in here, there's nothing to this. <laughs> We're going to drop the whole point of the movie for 45 minutes. I love it. Well, Scott, thank you for hanging out. Thank you for picking this insanity. It's uh, definitely insanity in its own little way. Yay! Folks, thanks for listening. And whatever you do, if you see Anthony Edwards, uh, I guess post-pandemic, just ask for his autograph. Don't think he's still playing yeah. Gotcha. You could ask him. <laughs> yes. Hey, I'm the biggest he, gotcha fan. He'll be like, oh, not another one. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. Like, if I, I, I've i gone to L.A. a few times, and I'm just like, if I ever run into someone, like Jennifer Aniston or someone, like, hey, I dig Leprechaun. I really don't like Leprechaun, <laughs> but I would want to bring up Leprechaun. Exactly. You know? That's uh, the just stuff you want to know like about. That movie, you know, that they, you know they don't want to bring up. It's like, Anthony Edwards, I wouldn't think he would be ashamed of Miracle Mile, but gotcha. <laughs> uh, George Clooney be like man I loved you in Return to Horror High Grizzly 2 bitches <laughs> oh I'm sure he's like oh no <laughs> one of you people some late show had Jennifer Connelly on a few years ago and brought up Phenomenon they they weren't taking it seriously and I'm like oh, you guys she is, no she has oh. never spoken well about her experiences in Italy because she did uh, phenomena and etoile. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Or etoile. E T O I L E. So she did two films in Italy. And I don't know which one she's speaking poorly of because that better not be phenomena. Right. I'm just like, I'm sorry, but, you know, phenomena is just like tremendous. Like, if I think of great Jennifer Connelly movies, I'm not thinking of Requiem for a Dream here. <laughs> nope, nope. Um, the only ass to ass I want is my gotcha gun. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> Bye, folks. <laughs> All right. Night, man. Hello, this is The Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not enough, go to at doomedmoviethon on Twitter. You can write in to Hello, This is the Doom Show, use the email doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Doom Show episodes are available on record and 8-track cassette.